brought to you by the Naked Scientists, the Cambridge Science Festival podcast. Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Science Festival podcast with me, Mira Senthilingam from thenakedscientists.com. Coming up on today's podcast, we bring you the highlights from the festival's big weekend where over 15,000 people visited the various lectures and hands-on activities taking place. We learn about the science of Doctor Who. We find out which events festival patron Carol Vorderman enjoyed. We investigate the science of beer and find out about a spoon that can clean itself. All that coming up on today's Cambridge Science Festival podcast. But first... Science Saturday saw over 80 events taking place all over Cambridge, with a large percentage of these providing hands-on experiments for you to try for yourself, varying from building a brain to making your own DNA. I spent the day roaming the festival's biology zones, starting with the Department of Pathology, where I met Christine Watson, who showed me an interesting display about breast cancer. Oh, well, this morning we're showing people how cells make milk. We're very interested in the mammary gland and how that goes wrong in cancer. But in order to do that, we need to understand normal mammary function. And so today we have an exhibit on breast cells and how they make milk. We have lots of interactive exhibits for the kids to look at different animals and how much milk they might make and to come and look at all the different things in milk and look at the fat and the protein and the sugars and all these things. And how are you displaying this? How is it in- Interactive. Uh, we have lots of posters and we have uh, Guess How Much Milk, a Meccano fax machine here, so the kids can put balls in the machine and study how we separate cells to determine their different functions. So you have everyone guessing how much milk these animals make, but I can actually see some milk and cheese down the end there. What's that for? Well, we thought it would be really exciting for people to taste different sorts of milk and realise how the flavour is actually made. So some animals make a lot of fat in the milk and some have much more sugar. And so we have milks to try here. We have goat's milk and cow's milk. And we even have milk from a plant, of soya milk, which <laughs> some people drink because they don't like animal milk. And so there's lots of things to try and taste. And so what are you hoping they walk away with having come to this section? I hope they'll they'll go away with an understanding of actually how exciting it is to study science and also to have some idea of how uh, the mammary gland actually makes milk. I think lots of people don't understand how cells make milk. And how do cells make milk? Ah, Well, during pregnancy, very special cells called ovular cells grow and these cells can then make protein and lipid and they then secrete that into the ducts in the gland and then when the infant suckles at at the teat, they can actually withdraw that milk. And these cells all die at the end of lactation when they're not needed anymore. And is it these cells that go wrong in cancer or is it a variety of cells? It's usually these kind of cells that go wrong in cancer. So if they don't die properly, then women can get cancer. In fact, dogs and other mammals can get cancer too. So we're really very interested in finding out how we can kill these cells if they go wrong. So I've wandered over to the new museum site and I'm here with festival patron Carol Vorderman. Hello, Carol. Hello. So what have you been doing this morning? Well, I was over uh, near Plant Sciences earlier on and um, seeing lots of people dressed up as bees and then getting lost in a very large uh, yellow flower. Then I was uh, getting my DNA extracted, shaken up in a little test tube along with various chemicals. Were you able to take it home with you? uh, Yes, you are. You can make it into a little necklace on your own test tube and take it home. How fantastic is that? And then I went to see um, the lecture about the science of Doctor Who, which was, oh, man, it's real. (laughs) What do you think is really good about the Science Festival and what do you hope people to get out of it? Well, exactly what is happening. They're doing things and coming out and saying, oh, I don't believe that. It's just that you go and you think, oh, I've never actually thought about that before. And now I'm quite excited about it. And I'm coming out with a little bit of knowledge, but a lot of interest. I've come over to the biology zone and it's extremely busy. There are hundreds of people queuing up outside just to come in. There's a whole variety of activities going on. Now, over in the distance, I can see children bashing a machine of some form with quite a lot of force, so I'm just going to go and see what that activity is about. So now I've come to a section where children are bashing away at a machine. Um, It's the Neuroni section, and I'm here with Isabel, who's organising this particular area. Hello, Isabel. Hello. So um, why are children bashing that machine over there? Actually, they're trying to get uh, their motor coordination as better as they can. So they're pressing one button to the next one for 45 seconds, and we're just recording how much they they do. We're using these tests in the clinic, 
These are used in the diagnostic for patients with Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. What else have you got going on in this section? Actually, in this section we have building a brain in Play-Doh. We try to sensitize people to uh, what is brain science. And the idea is, is to sensitize kids to how complex the brain can be by making them uh, make a brain in 10 steps. So the person that's actually created the Build a Brain section is Dr Lizzie Burns from the University of Oxford. Hello, Lizzie. Hello. So um, what's, what's that section all about? The idea is to sort of inspire and engage people with the brain, which is, I think, the most fascinating organ in our body. It's really what makes us who we are. It's where everything that we experience is happening, all our memories. It's extraordinary to think that a strange wrinkle thing is responsible for all those feelings. So it's also about trying to appreciate how beautiful it is. The real thing doesn't look very beautiful, it has to be said, but it is beautiful in terms of what it does. So people are actually able to sort of find out about what's inside their brain. It's, there's loads of things in there as well, and what each part does, what would happen if those parts weren't working as well, what effect that would have on the person. So I've actually run this sort of workshop for very young children who love it, all the way up to real leading neuroscientists in their field and they've loved it too so everyone turns into an instant child it's wonderful so i've come over to the brain section and i'm here with sam who's currently in the middle of making a brain hello sam hello so what have you been doing here um i've been making a brain there's this like instruction thing and it tells you all the parts of the brain and you have to make them in a certain order and each one's a different color And which stage are you at now? I'm on the last stage. Oh, okay. so your brain's nearly there. Oh, actually, I can see it. It's very impressive. So what have you learnt new today? I've learnt, like, which part controls which bit. The front part that I'm making now controls the personality. The top part controls the movement and touch. And the sides control um, vision. Um, and the stem controls um, like your breathing and your heart. So I've come into a room which seems to have a food version of Twister on the floor. <laughs> I'm here with Becky Lang, who's from the MRC's Human Nutrition Research Unit. So, Becky, what's going on in this section? OK, well, today we're highlighting all the nutrition research we do both here in Cambridge and our collaborations with countries around the world. So we've got um, the big floor game that you mentioned is covered in different fruits and vegetables and uh, meats and all the different things you might find in a healthy diet, and that's a kind of fun way of getting the kids to talk about five a day, fruits and vegetables, what you might have in a healthy balanced diet and then to complement that we've got some blind tasting of different fruits from around the world that they can taste and see if they can guess what it is. Hopefully some of them won't have tried them before and it might be something a bit novel and then we've highlighted in our display some fruits and vegetables from around the world. So some popular ones that people might recognise like pineapple and then some more um, unusual ones like bitter gourd or okra that you might not pick up in your usual level local supermarket then we've got our body fat experiment going on so what we're doing is getting people to stand on the scales to get their body fat measured but the machine that we're using can also measure the amount of fat in your arms and legs as well so we're having a look at right and left handers to see who whether you have more fat in your dominant hand or not so we're building up the numbers over the day and hopefully we'll see a pattern is there a pattern emerging so far as expected we've got a lot of right handers coming through very few left at the moment and those those people that your dominant arm tends to have slightly less fat in it than your less dominant arm probably because you're using it more and you've got a bit more muscle there so it's kind of following the the pattern really there's a few outliers as you would expect in any science experiment so just to keep things a bit more interesting One of the stars of the festival today has been Bjorn the polar bear who's here as part of National Science and Engineering Week and one of the people that helped out with today's event is Stephen Stratton from the Cambridge Zero Carbon Society. Hello Stephen. Hello. So what have you been talking to the children about today? So we're here really to let the children know what they can do to tackle climate change in their everyday lives. For example, transport, using the bike, heating in the, in the home, closing windows and turning the heating down, and also in regard to electricity, so switching the lights off. During the session you were asking them what they could do and they actually seemed to know quite a lot already, didn't they? They're enormously well educated for children of 5 to 10. They really know an awful lot. In fact, they were giving us some tips. What else did you want the children to walk away with today? 
Well, I think they need to connect what is happening to our world with their everyday actions that they and their families can make. And really, I think this is bringing home to them in a very visual and appealing way. So it was nice to tie in something like a polar bear, because obviously the kids were very excited about seeing Bjorn. So what made you bring that in as part of getting this message across? Well, I think it's, it's really very appealing. It's, uh, the polar bear is cuddly, it's lifelike, it's very animated, and really it excites children who often have a short attention span, although I didn't see any evidence of that here tonight. It's sometimes a disconnected topic. There's some problem somewhere else in the world, and really to feel empathy with a, an animal. Um, of course, the, the natural world is the most sensitive to climate change. It's that which is going to be the most uh, soon affected or the most seriously affected. To really link it with the empathy that one naturally feels for a polar bear is, I think, a really great way to communicate climate change. Bjorn certainly was very popular. And the children I spoke to afterwards had learnt a lot about helping our environment. Now, one of the most popular parts of this year's festival has been the opportunity to meet the monsters of Doctor Who, something Carol Vorderman was very excited about, as we heard earlier. But these monsters may be great science fiction, but do they really belong at a festival of science? It seems that, much like space in the TARDIS, there may be more science in Doctor Who than there appears to be as Naked Scientist Ben found out. I'm here at the Science Festival with Dr Paul Parsons, author of The Science of Doctor Who. Now, is there really any science in Doctor Who, or is it more fiction? Well, actually, there's a surprising amount of science in Doctor Who, not just the obvious topics like regeneration and space flight and things like that. You know, there are actual real sonic screwdrivers being used in modern factories. There are protective shields for tanks that are being developed which can dissolve projectiles just like the Daleks did back in the first relaunch series. There's all kinds of things going on and I was just staggered when I started ringing up scientists and finding out this kind of thing, you know, because I thought it was going to be quite a limited amount of stuff that I could talk about. I was literally blown away by how much there is out there. So if we're using sonic screwdrivers now, is that a case of art influencing science? I don't think they were already in action when we started including them in science fiction. They probably didn't a result from science fiction. You know, I think this is just something that people have developed. I mean, I say sonic screwdrivers, they're kind of sonic tools. They use sound energy for soldering electrical components in place and that kind of thing. Uh, and you can use them for cutting fabrics and that sort of stuff, you know, these little sonic beams. To actually make something with as much oomph as the Doctor's sonic screwdriver would probably be a lot harder, you know. Back in the old series, he kind of blows up landmines with the sonic screwdriver from a distance of about 20 metres. Getting something powerful enough to do that, he'd probably need a nuclear generator, which is you know, more than Tom Baker could probably fit in his pockets. So probably a little way to go until you can have a real practical sonic screwdriver like we see in Doctor Who. But, you know, the basic sorts of things are being used. Yeah, sure. And surely the laws of physics don't let us have something like a TARDIS where it's actually bigger inside than it is on the outside. It's something you can do in principle, actually. Um, There was a guy back in the late 90s came up with a way of arranging this special kind of material. He calls it exotic matter because it's actually got negative pressure, which means that if you blow up your car tyres with the stuff, they actually get flatter, which is quite bizarre in itself. This chap, Chris Vandenbroek at the University of Cardiff, figured out a way of arranging exotic matter in just the right way that it would actually bend space and time uh, into this bubble, which was actually bigger inside than it was on the outside. The trouble is you'd need probably about 10 million billion kilograms of exotic matter to do this, which is about the size of a medium-sized asteroid. So it's not something we're going to do anytime soon, but it's possible in principle. So if these things were to be possible, what would be the one thing from Doctor Who that you would like to see in common use? Oh, that's interesting. Um, Hmm. Well, time travel would be good, but it's probably maybe a bit obvious. Um, So maybe one thing that I'd like... There was an episode of Doctor Who called uh, Nightmare in Eden where there was this machine which was kind of like a virtual safari park where it could, like, capture locations from all around the universe and then project them, but project them as a hologram so you could actually go in and walk around. So you could visit places virtually, if you like, and um, without having to get on planes and pollute the environment and all that kind of thing. So I think I'd have one of them. It does sound like a very good way to cut down on your carbon footprint. Absolutely, yeah. See, Doctor Who even had the carbon footprint licked. How clever is that? Also at the festival is extreme scientist Dr Basil Singer. Hi. Hello, hello. How's it going? Very good, thank you. And you? Very good. This is an amazing event this year. You've got so many people here, it's the most packed out I've ever seen it. Carol Vorderman is on form. And what's more, you've got the science of Doctor Who and queues. I can't get in, I'd really like to go and see it. But queues are all the way out the door, around the building and up the block. It's 
proved to be a massive hit. Well, your own event was on the science of skateboarding and extreme sports, and that also had cues down, pretty much down to the river. And to be honest, it's the only science show I've seen where you had five kids on stage on skateboards. What inspired you to use skateboards to demonstrate physics? Why not, you know? I mean, mechanics essentially can be taught as such a dry subject. It's just the physics of motion. And what better way to use analogies than through extreme sports to try and describe those physics of motions uh, and the dynamics that occurs when you're doing some cool sports. And do you find that people get distracted by the fact that there are skateboards around or do people take the physics in? I'd like to think that the kids take the physics in. I've talked to parents after the event before and the parents have come up to me and said, I don't think you really got this idea across because I was distracted by this and that. And their children have said, what are you talking about? Uh, angular momentum, I totally get it. I totally understand moment of inertia now and why I speed up when I bring my hands in, when I'm spinning. And, and the kids just really do, I hope anyway, relate to what I'm saying. Well, other than snowboarding live on stage and bringing your own snow dome, what do you think you'll do next? What's the next good way to demonstrate physics to kids? Oh, that's a very, very good question. I think I'm going to continue doing this physics of extreme sports lecture because it's a great way to explain mechanics. I'd also like to branch out into sound, music. How does sound travel through the air? How do different instruments make those different sounds? And I could bring in a guitar, do a massive rock riff, or I could bring in my drums and have a mash away at the drum kit. I think that could be really interesting. Well, I look forward to seeing what happens in the future. Uh, Dr Basil Singer, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. That was Dr Basil Singer, proving that skateboarders and skydivers are actually experts in applied mechanics. A far cry from his last appearance at the festival alongside a jet-powered sheep. It looks like we can expect a lot more exciting science from Basil in the future. Unravelling the Cambridge Science Festival. The Naked Scientists online at thenakedscientist.com Now it's time to hear from Poppy at Newnham Cross Primary School with today's festive question. It's why the Earth is round. And here's Ali Davies from the University of Cambridge Cavendish Laboratories with the answer. OK, well, the Earth is an object that uh, has gravitational forces on it, like everything else in, uh, in space and in the universe. And gravity will pull all of the Earth in towards the centre. If the Earth wasn't round, if it was square-shaped, cubic-shaped, then the pointy edges out towards the outside of the cube would get pulled down until they flattened out and made a round shape. So that explains why all the planets, not only Earth, are round. After a long day at the festival, it's nice just to sit down with a drink and relax. And what better way than to discover the science of beer? Part of the festivities is a look into the science of beer, and I'm here with Nigel Davis. Hi, Nigel. I believe you work on making the stuff that brewers make the beer from, is that right? Yes, that's right. I think one of the key things with malt is the fact that it's natural and uh, there's a great emphasis on that now with uh, people wanting all natural ingredients. It's a, it's a great product. So what actually is malt? What do you take and what do you do to it? That's a very good question. People don't really understand it. It doesn't grow. It grows as barley and barley is very hard, uh, but it's a fantastic cereal, of course. And uh, you can malt any cereal, but uh, barley is particularly special because it makes fantastic malt. And basically all you do is uh, you turn a very hard barley into a very soft malt. It sounds simple, I know, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and what we do basically in the, uh, in the process, we're just using water and heat. And we try to grow the barley under controlled conditions. And those controlled conditions mean that we don't use the starch up inside because ultimately the brewer wants to turn that starch into sugar. But that's not enough for the yeast to grow on because the yeast also needs uh, a source of nitrogen. And the barley can provide that. So it actually comes from when the rootlets grow. But we don't want it to grow a lot because if it grows, it uses the starch up. And then the starch isn't available to make uh, the sugar and we don't get any alcohol. So it all has to be controlled. It sounds like a really complicated process with a very simple title. Yeah, I think it probably is. I mean, uh, if you look at the, the actual process, it doesn't take that long particularly. It takes a couple of days to get the grain wet enough so that then you leave it in uh, affected what looks like a large box. Sometimes school children say it looks like a swimming pool. The grain will sit there uh, and it will germinate over about four to five days. And at that point then it's uh, developed all of the 
building blocks for flavour. It's developed the, uh, the amino acids and the sugars. And basically, we gently cook that then uh, in a kiln. And it will generate some colour and it will generate some flavour. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to get rid of the enzymes that we've made that will subsequently break down the, uh, the starch into sugar. And are the enzymes something that you add to the product or do they come from the barley naturally? No, again, that's something that's particularly good for uh, the process. You can actually brew a beer just using the barley and uh, tip a bucket load of enzymes in. That would be a horrible process, of course, because the barley actually makes the enzymes itself quite naturally. Uh, it makes a whole range of them and it takes about four days. That's why we, it takes four days to germinate because it, it generates these uh, enzymes to break the starch down itself, of course, because it's expecting to grow. So we want okay, to get well, it going, the earth is so an the starch that, is all ready to uh, grow and then stop it. Forces but on the, it like the enzymes that we in, make uh, there, the uh, the we kill very um, gently, because otherwise the heat would destroy them, because the, the enzymes are protein. Towards the centre. By if the, the earth barley to sprout, wasn't round, if it was like square-shaped, cubic-shaped, then the pointy edges out towards the outside of the cube would get pulled down until they and made yeah, well, I'm glad you said shape. that because it's something that we are actually trying to, uh, to promote uh, in foods and in beer. Maybe it's a little bit difficult in, in beer because of the alcohol, but it's particularly high in a number of things. For example, it's high in silicon, and there's a great link with the silicon in malt that can prevent osteoporosis. Uh, in fact, some work at Cambridge has been showing that. Uh, there's also a lot of folate in there, which uh, people would probably have heard of folic acid and uh, uh, when ladies are pregnant. Uh, maybe they wouldn't drink the alcohol, but a little would be good. Uh, and the other thing is particularly high in vitamin B12. And if you've read your cornflakes package, you'll know that it's particularly great for you, vitamin B12, for, uh, for the brain power. So malt will be good for your brain power as well. Well, that's good to hear. And I think we should take advantage of some malt to enjoy the Kaylee that's going on now as well. So thank you ever so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Also with me is Steve Banford from Buntingford Brewery, and you've brewed a special beer just for the Science Festival. Tell me a bit about that. Um, yeah, basically it's... Uh, well, it's very hoppy sort of beer we were approached to do this back in november last year and we agreed to do a special beer to promote the event very much an early days scenario for tonight so we didn't quite know what's going to happen but we, uh, we came up with a name and thought well if we're going to call it, we've got to make a nice bitter hoppy beer so we've sourced hops from two or three countries around the world and used them in uh, copious quantities to to get a beer that we'd like to think everyone finds quite full of flavor so, so what is it that, about the hops that gives that bitter flavor Without getting too technical about it, there's uh, something called an alpha acid, which provides all the, the bitterness in the beer. And the use of American hops has uh, given us a hop variety that's got a very high level of alpha acid. So we get a, a phenomenally great level of bitterness. And we have the added benefit of, uh, if used carefully, we get a, a good level of aroma and additional fruity flavours as well. And will this beer be available in the shops anywhere, or is it only on sale at the festival? Uh, the beer's actually been available in a number of the, uh, the better free houses around Cambridge. Cambridgeshire for the last two or three weeks. Um, as from tonight, probably won't be available anywhere. I think it's all been sold out now, uh, but it, it may well be brewed again. And just in case uh, there is any still available, what's the beer called? Uh, the beer is called A Little Bitter Science. It's caught the attention of a few people. That was Nigel Davis from Munton's PLC and Steve Banford from Buntingford Brewery talking to Ben about A Little Bit of Science. Now, all the highlights we've brought you so far are from Science Saturday, but the festivities continued into Sunday, where the university's sites in the west of Cambridge hosted all the fun. I went along to the Cavendish Laboratories, where physics is in its element, and saw all the activities provided by Cambridge Hands-On Science, also known as Chaos. The site that caught my eye had magical spoons and butterfly wings, and I soon found out that this was all to do with nanoscience. Here's Alex Elbro telling me more. Well, basically, we're trying to show people what nanotechnology is and what applications are already existing and also what things may come in the future. And so how are you trying to teach them about what nanotechnology is? We've got various displays here going from the scale of nanotechnology, which is 10 to the minus 9, so it's a billionth of a metre. So we're trying to show the examples of things things that we can see and things that we can't see. And then we've got some model making of carbon molecules for the children to make buckyballs out of paper. We've also shown the difference between pigment colours and structural colours. Are they butterfly wings we've got yeah. here? Because nanotechnology a lot of the time replicates nature. And so we looked at the structure of butterfly wings and you can see that the colour changes depending on how the light reflects and refracts 
on the butterfly wings. So in the laboratories here, we try to replicate that by building transparent films of different thicknesses to show how light changes the colour of them, depending on which way you look at them. And this would be something that would probably be find a potential application for forgery and counterfeiting. Also, we have some spoons that clean themselves. Yes, I've seen those, actually. They're quite amazing. So what's that about? Again, that's a, a sort of Teflon coating, but taken a stage further, so it's looking on the nanoscale, so the Teflon is patterned so that it becomes hydrophobic to water and also to honey or syrup. As part of the demonstration, I think one of the volunteers has been putting water on it. It's quite amazing just to see it as an actual droplet just sitting on the spoon. You don't often see water bouncing, but it, it rolls off and bounces. We also have some products available now, such as a shirt that we bought commercially, which does the same sort of idea. The fibres are have nano whiskers in them, so effectively they're spiky to the water, and again, the water doesn't sit on it. You've also got quite a funny activity here, which looks a bit like Jenga or something. Well, the idea from this is everything on the nanoscale is so hard to work on because it is atomic scale. We're trying to scale this up and show that it's like moving Jenga wearing oven gloves. <laughs> so the children are having a go at trying to play a game of Jenga wearing either oven gloves or huge rubber gauntlets and just show how hard it is to manipulate atoms. So how have the children and how have the visitors been reacting to the station today? Have they really enjoyed it? I think people are very interested to see that lots of the products we have here, such as sun cream, plasters, are things that we see all around us now. And it's just showing that nano isn't something to be frightened of. It's all around us now. That was Alex Elbro from the university's Nanoscience Centre, giving us a heads up into our future of self-cleaning cutlery and clothing. That's all for the highlights from the big weekend. But the festival is far from over there are still plenty of lectures and activities taking place during the week. So in the next podcast, we learn about a new breed of science known as quirkology, and we find out the secret to happiness, as well as the science behind heartbreak. I'm Mira Senthilingam, and this edition of the Cambridge Science Festival podcast was produced by thenakedscientists.com. Scientists.com.